part of the graveyard, do you think? Um, I would say the oldest part would be right around the church because it started in the left. Jan Davis has come all the way from California to look for her Cornish roots. This is William Perry, who died at Trelore Farm in this parish, December the 17th, 1891, age 64. Helped by a Cornish friend, Sue Elliott, from Penn Ponds near Canbourne, Jan is searching for her Perry ancestors. Well, I've been working on my family history off and on uh, for probably 25 years, you know, a little here, a little there, when I can had time in between raising kids and jobs and such. The Perry family um, first went to Connecticut for a couple of years, and then they got, got themselves to California. I'm not too sure how. They were in the New Almaden area near San Jose in a quicksilver mine area. Jan is one of an increasing number of people worldwide who are taking their Cornish ancestry seriously. Hundreds of descendants of Cornish emigres came to Falmouth's Pendennis Castle in May to take part in the first ever Dwellens, a Cornish word meaning homecoming. kicked off with a parade of flags representing Cornish communities the world over. A quarter of a million people left Cornwall for overseas in the hundred years between the end of the Napoleonic Wars and the start of the First World War. Altogether, as many as six million people around the world are now claiming Cornish descent. We followed a group of them who all had personal reasons for attending the Wellens. I'm Jim Warren, and I'm from the Chicago area. We're Ken and Jenny Jeffrey from Melbourne, Australia. I'm Jan Davis, and I'm from just outside San Diego, California and uh, I work as a real estate agent. My father is the only one of his generation left and uh, he's 92 and so he has a living memory of his grandfather who was one of the ones that came out from Cornwall and I know dad would be absolutely delighted if we could find out uh, and actually view the house or the plot of ground if, it's, if the house is not there where his great grandfather lived. That would be fantastic. I have names and dates and all that kind of stuff about my families that came from here, but I want to go find out where they were from and walk the streets and just kind of, you know, experience Cornwall because it's so different from where I'm from. I think I am. Here you are, Jim. Thank you. Uh, you've got your passport. When he's not working as a software instructor, Jim Warren is a singer of Cornish folk songs. He has an extra special reason for being here. Well, I have, have been done the great honor of being uh, asked to join the Cornish Gorseth as a bard, and I was just um, amazed when I found that out. I suppose it's because of the fact that I've doing, been doing some performing at various Celtic festivals around the states and uh, tried to promote Cornwall and Cornishness there. And um, also, I'm again hoping to find some more music here, some more recordings, talk with some of my musician friends and see if they can teach me some new songs and uh, uh, just generally find some more music to play back home. The first day of Dwellens ended with a reception which gave people a chance to catch up with old friends, or in some cases with people they'd only met previously on the internet. I 
was standing next to this lady at one of the booths, you know, looking in books, and I just kind of glanced at her, I saw her name tag, and it's somebody in, from Australia that we've been emailing back and forth, and I looked at her and said, oh, you're you, I'm me, and we were, oh, a big old hug. Jim, on the other hand, spent most of the day mooching around Falmouth. Some people, that what they come here for is to research ancestry and all of that, and that's fine. I respect that. Um, it's just I prefer my people breathing. I, and I'm not much for sitting around in lectures and, and that. So actually what I did while others were attending that sort of thing, I went down into town, walked about, looked in the shops, and had a snack and talked to people. Ken, meanwhile, tried to get to grips with the British public transport system. <laughs> there, there was a little bit of glitch in the system there somewhere. The, uh, uh, we waited uh, 40 minutes for a bus that was supposed to be running every half hour, uh, and then we found that it had actually uh, gone to deliver some school kids home. <laughs> The reception showcased some of the finest in Cornish entertainment, including the national champion youth band from St. Kevin. was given over to a celebration of all things Cornish. And what could be more Cornish than a male voice choir? Except that this Cornish male voice choir, led by Eleanor Knitzer, is from Grass Valley, California. Valley would not be if it hadn't been for the hard rock miners of Cornwall who came and, and brought the Cornish pump and the way of mining. Um, I don't think most Americans at that point knew how to mine. And our gold mines in Grass Valley were the richest in all of California for a lot of years. Grass Valley was one of the main mining areas to attract Cornishmen and their families to America. Michigan was another. My great grandfather was a miner from the Helston area and uh, when work got short of course like most people he uh, went to the states to Michigan upper Michigan uh, became a miner and a mine captain and ultimately a farmer Jim is one of several people being honored for their services to Cornish culture overseas at the main event of the day a Cornish Gorseth proclamation I really wanted to make this a memory. I really wanted to remember this. So I tried to, to concentrate very much on what was going on. The funny thing was, I wasn't really aware of walking across there. I was so concentrated on where I was going. I'm glad there weren't any big holes in the ground or something that would have fallen right in. The Gorseth is one expression of what is separate and distinct about the Cornish. Another is the Cornish language used for most of the ceremony. A bell and Tavis cows is a miskin wearing. A reek Merriwell, Martez and Nanju, Kansas Hunter Blithen. A beast in term Henry Jenner, a scrivener's a liver, let's learn Cornish for handbook of the Cornish language. Uh, Dallas and against this Kansas Blithen, Eno Dallas Arta and Tavis cows is. Meal Gwellis, Canute the Crafe. I'm a moy, a moy hadis, is the accusal Canute and Jay Thedu. I can terminate the windows, you crave in our breeze. If you mirror every and have us canoeic them, uh, that the brothers was canoeic, raise you them, cues of canoeic. Hep canoeic, hep and have us canoeic, ninja's colonel, and you all breeze. Day two ended with our multinational audience being treated to more Cornish entertainment. 
which included Will Coleman's story of how a drunken almighty god came to give Cornwall to the Cornish. Right on. <laughs> but now, he said, God, I, I need to go and see an angel about a dog. <laughs> As God left the pub, he tripped and fell head forward into the mud, splash. And as he went down, the golden horn of plenty snapped from his waist and tumbled, spinning in a golden arc through the air, and all its goods spilled out. And when the Cornish come running out the pub to pick God up and dust him off, and they stood in amazement, because there, stretched out into the bluest, perfect ocean, was a horn-shaped land jam-packed with good and plenty. Deep in its granite bones there was minerals and gems, tin and copper. And God looked at it with him and he said, Go on then. It's all yours. Go forth and multiply. <laughs> The final day of de Wellens consisted of a coach tour starting at Gwanat Pit. Any potential blasphemy occasioned by Will Coleman's performance the night before was redeemed by this visit to Cornwall's Mecca of Methodism. John Wesley preached here to 20,000 people in 1781. Today it was the turn of Truro's Bishop Bill Ind. Whenever I come to Gwanat Pit, I think always of all the Cornish people scattered throughout the world. And we see in a way their monuments in the great engine houses that are all around us here. And we know that many of them, indeed it's estimated a third of the male working force moved abroad, moved to Australia and to Canada and to South Africa, to South America, all around the world. And you know better than I do that it's commonly said if there's a deep hole anywhere, if you shout for long enough, a Cornish man will come up from underground. <laughs> and it's of them I think we need to begin by thinking today. Because in a sense, we represent them by being here. In this very special place. This holy place. Which is in a way at the centre of so much that is Cornish and special. As we go round this roundabout, if you look out to your left, you can see the mining headgear of the South Crofty Mine. continued on to St. Michael's Mount, where it was welcomed ashore by Lord St. Levin. I was president of the London Cornish Association for about 20 years, and we were in touch with all the Cornish Associations all over the world. It was a great welcome to see them all here. Some of them come back again and again, and it's wonderful their great uh, feeling for their homeland and to come back here. And of course, St. Michael's Mount is something they must see when they're in Cornwall. It's just glorious. It's sort of a lodestone and focus for Cornishness in general, isn't it? And uh, Cornish Americans, if, even if they haven't been here, recognize a picture of St. Michael's Mount. This is a treat for us because we don't have anything that's old in Australia. If it's over 100 years old, it's, you know, it's really old. But yeah. here, the antiquity of the place is just amazing. And to think that people have been here for such a long, long time, and yet it's still standing and it's still fine. Dwellens was now coming to an end. It finished with another night of Cornish entertainment at Falmouth's Princess Pavilion, 
which included the Prairie Singers' first ever performance on Cornish soil. They're older than Christ and deeper than hell, but the tin mines of Cornwall will see 99. The life of the land has come out of the mine shaft, the heart of the Cornishman's down in the mine. Before there were Christians, before there were Romans, the world came to Cornwall to bargain for tin. Tin for the swords to spill blood on the beet fields, tin for the plowshares to till them again. And they're older than Christ and deeper than hell, but the tin mines of Cornwall won't see 99. The life of the land has come out of the mine shaft. The, the Dwellen's event itself might be over, but for some, the serious stuff is only just beginning. Next morning, at the guest house where he's staying, Ken Jeffrey showed us his family tree. He's hoping to find the house that Philip Jeffrey lived in before leaving for the Australian gold fields in the 1850s. Now, Philip uh, is, is up here, and you follow his line down, and, uh, and his children are along here. Now, his eldest son is Joseph. Uh, Joseph, in my father's recollections, was a, uh, a very gentle man. Uh, unfortunately, he liked the drink, and that's why, even though our family um, uh, did, in fact, strike it rich on the Bathurst Gold Fell, uh, none of it came down. <laughs> they blew it all as fast as they got it out of the ground. Ken used the Family Search website to trace his great-great-grandfather and then phoned Cornwall Records Office. Oh, fine, that's great. That's Perrin Wharf, wasn't it? Would you spell that for me? They were able to tell him the district Philip lived in just before he set sail. Jan, meanwhile, was still on the trail of her Perry ancestors. With the help of her Cornish friend Sue, she found an abundance of them in Wendron, both outside and inside the church. In memory of Susan Ann Perry of Kennap Cottage, who died on February 21st, 1947, at Morgan? Morgan. Morgan. Morgan in... Minique. Minique. Morgan in Minique. Age Minique. Minique. <laughs> Morgan in Minique. Age 94 years. It's been overwhelming. It's just amazing. And I, it's not a matter of probably. We have the names and the dates. I know when they died, and so it's like, oh, that's them. It's been amazing. And we found the most right here. Jan and Sue decide to go in search of the farms named on the headstones to see if they can find any living Perry descendants. They found all of the farms, but not one had a Perry still in residence. But at Trevilges, they did find someone who had some useful information for them. My connection with Trevilges Farm is because my father was born here, born in 1892. Ivan Perry's grandfather farmed here in the 19th century. He died in 1895 and his father before him died in 1894 both Edward Perry's which are the headstones are in the Wendron church mm. tell me about the farm what kind was it animals or crops or what well, here I yeah. say that uh, there was a mix of farming here uh, back in my grandfather's time Ivan showed them his family tree this is Ivan Day Perry here which is me and I'm one of uh, my sister my brother, and go back to her father Morris, Edward Ernest Perry, who married Jane Ursa uh, Richards. We're looking for Peter Perry and Martha Jenkins. Yeah, Peter Perry and Martha oh, Jenkins right up here. They were married okay. 27th of May, 1784. And yep. you have on your list, we I have do. the same one. Well, there you I are. have them on your eighth generation back. Uh -huh. When my grandmother told me years ago, you know, like 20, 30 years ago, I guess, that she said they came from Land's End, England. That's all she knew. And now I just almost feel like I should buy a house and come here for half the year, because it's like, you know, I just feel like it's home. 
they're talking about doing this again in two more years. And I'm hoping to get my son and my daughter-in-law to come back that time. I want somebody to carry on so I can turn it over to them and keep on going, you know. It's been fun. <laughs> Ken and Jenny went to have a look at Perrin Wharf without knowing which house Philip Jeffrey had lived in. But Peter Doe from the Cornish Forefathers Society was on hand to help them out. Great, great grandfather, I think. Yes, isn't it? Yes, well, I've done some Dalvin imagery and I think I have some good luck for you. Oh. Excellent. All right. Excellent. Wonderful. It took some time, but we have managed, I think, to trace the house where your great grandfather would have set out from and where he actually lived. Wonderful. Like back off the 1851 census. Yeah. And your great great grandmother lived here. Really? This, this, this house on here. the corner. This here. house here. From, uh, from here to, to the, to the gate. It would, have been a, it would have been a two up, two down cottage. Two and, up and two down. And yeah, you would have had a, a lounge or a scullery kitchen and two bedrooms if he was lucky, or one bedroom and a bathroom, because the bathroom would have been out the back. And if you look at the back, you would have seen the buildings at the back would have been the, the outside privies from those days. They didn't yeah, know. yeah. So when you say two up, two down, there's, there's yeah. only one window there, but yeah. there'd be two rooms up there somewhere. Yeah, there'd be two rooms, one at the front, one at the back. Oh, one at the front, one at the back. Yep, yep, yep. And yep, one yep. little chimney. And one little chimney. Oh, wonderful. Peter also established that Philip Jeffrey almost certainly worked here at the now derelict Perrin foundry as an engineer. There is no way that we could have uh, uh, found out the information by ourselves that we found out this afternoon. It just wouldn't be possible. My excitement is, uh, is based around the notion of being where my family came from. Yeah. And, and that's why the pinnacle is to be here, knowing that I'm probably standing on a spot that he stood on, my great-grandfather. Uh, so you're actually seeing the place and experiencing something, albeit centuries after, something of what he experienced at, uh, at living in Cornwall, and that's, that's special. I would love to come back. In fact, uh, they're planning another dwellings for two years, and uh, uh, I'll be saving my pennies as hard as I can to try and get back, but that'll depend on finances. The first ever de Welland was reckoned to be a great success. September the 11th did stop a lot of Americans coming this time. So if it does happen again in two years, the organizers will be expecting an even bigger turnout. Proof indeed that Cornish identity is alive and well, far beyond the shores of the Cornish homeland. <laughs>